The first president of the United States, George Washington, is more well known for his Revolutionary War service than anything he actually did as president. However, his eight-year presidency was perhaps just as important to ensuring America's survival. Washington had already gone a long way towards saving the nation simply by taking on the responsibility of being president. In the years that followed the revolution, America had become fractured, weak, and unstable. France fully expected America's collapse and was already making plans on how to take advantage of the situation. Great Britain was hoping to regain their colonies at least in some capacity. The lack of any strong central leadership meant that the individual states were tearing the nation apart. As different states and regions of the country were out for their own interest, rivalries only grew more bitter. Without a strong leader, no authority could ensure the states would work together rather than compete with each other. And it wasn't just a matter of having anyone as president. Electing the wrong person could have fractured the nation even more. Despite fierce divisions, everyone agreed that George Washington was the man for the job. Washington didn't want to serve. He only did so for the good of the country, and only after countless requests. And in doing so, he bought the infantile America more time. But if he didn't make the right decisions, it could still collapse. Many were still confident that the United States only had one more year at best. It was all on Washington to not only save the nation, but also ensure its long-term survival, and to do so in a way that aligned with its founding principles, so that it wouldn't devolve into tyranny. No issue was more pressing than the debt. The nation had accumulated massive amounts of debt during the Revolutionary War and was essentially bankrupt. The larger issue, however, was to come up with a plan to make sure the states actually paid off their debt rather than dodging the issue, something the Continental Congress had failed to do. Washington promoted a plan proposed by his Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, which entailed the federal government taking on all of the state's debts and paying them off through taxes. The issue, however, was controversial with another member of Washington's cabinet, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson feared a strong federal government and saw the power to assume states' debts as a step in that direction. Furthermore, some southern states had already paid off much of their debts. Thus, Hamilton's plan would initially favor the North. However, Jefferson worked out a compromise with Hamilton leading to the plan becoming law. One of the other major issues over the course of Washington's presidency was establishing America's place on the international stage. Washington's policy towards foreign conflicts became one of neutrality. This was his way of dealing with the French Revolution. His stance was controversial as many Americans supported aiding the revolution. The French Revolution started in the first months of Washington's presidency. Generally speaking, Americans saw this as a sister revolution to their own. An oppressed population was fighting against a monarchical government in favor of a more republican one. However, as the years passed, the revolution raged on and became increasingly radical through major social changes and ever-escalating violence. Over time, many Americans became more and more weary of it. Washington had been skeptical of the revolution and only became more so with time. He feared that endorsing the French in any way would mean inviting those same radical sentiments to the United States, which he believed could destroy the nation. In 1793, early in his second term, he issued a proclamation of neutrality, which declared the United States wouldn't take the side of France or the side of its neighbors. Furthermore, he put down the activities of French ambassador Edmund Charles Genet. Genet had been trying to rally Americans against the Washington administration and in support of France. The other motivation for neutrality was to improve relations with Great Britain. Siding with the French would mean inevitable war with Britain. America was still fragile and perhaps the last thing it could afford was another war.
the British were already accusing the United States of aiding the French, and in 1793 began confiscating United States ships trading with France. Furthermore, relations between the two countries were still strained from America's Revolutionary War. The British were still carrying out impressment of American sailors, capturing sailors and forcing them to work on British ships. They were still preventing the United States from participating in the profitable West Indian trade, and they still occupied forts on the United States' western front, despite having agreed to abandon them. Between 1794 and 1795, Washington oversaw the writing and ratification of the Jay Treaty to resolve many of these issues and avoid war with Great Britain for the time being. Washington might have averted war, but in doing so, he spurred on the political war within the nation. Thomas Jefferson and his followers disliked Washington's neutrality in regards to France. They saw the French Revolution as a natural extension of the American Revolution. And even though Jefferson eventually turned against the French due to the extreme violence of the Reign of Terror, his underlying sentiments remained. Hamilton, on the other hand, saw the French Revolution as something else entirely, believing that at its core, it didn't represent the ideals represented by the American Revolution. This division between Thomas Jefferson and his followers, and Alexander Hamilton and his, didn't just start with the French Revolution. It had been brewing for years, and the French Revolution just further defined it. Generally speaking, Hamilton represented the interest of people living in the cities who believed America needed a strong central government, whereas Jefferson represented agrarian interest and strongly supported a decentralized government. Washington was well aware of these differences. He'd hoped that by placing both men on his cabinet, he'd engender a spirit of cooperation and promote national unity. Not only did Washington fail in this aim, but he might have exacerbated the issue. During Jefferson's time in the cabinet, he simply grew more and more resentful as he watched Washington repeatedly favor Hamilton's ideas, whether it be dealing with the debt or with the French Revolution. To Jefferson, Washington's calls for unity were just calls for Jefferson and his Republicans to submit. By the start of Washington's second term, the two parties that would dominate American politics for the next two decades were already forming, something Washington greatly lamented. There were many other issues during the Washington presidency. He oversaw the creation of the Capitol as Washington, D.C. When Washington took office, he resided in New York City. The city was simply the temporary capital until a permanent capital could be decided upon. Once again, this was a controversial issue. As Southerners and Northerners both wanted the capital to be in their respective regions. Eventually, Jefferson and Hamilton decided to place the capital in Maryland as a compromise, as it was between North and South. George Washington then chose the exact site for the new city and appointed the architect who was to come up with a bold and modern design for it. While the city was under construction, Washington moved to Philadelphia, which had become the nation's new temporary capital from 1790 to 1800. George Washington oversaw the construction of Washington, D.C., but never actually lived there, let alone lived in the White House. The White House was only completed in 1800, three years after Washington's presidency ended and a year after his death. Washington was also the first president to deal with a rebellion. The Whiskey Rebellion broke out in response to Hamilton's new taxing plan, which placed a heavy tax on whiskey, which hurt Americans in western Pennsylvania. The rebellion lasted for three years and ended when George Washington personally led troops in the field to put the rebellion down in 1794, the second year of his second term. For the most part, Washington was able to put the rebellion down without violence. By the time he arrived, most of the rebels had dispersed. There were only 170 arrests made and two convictions, though Washington pardoned both men. One of Washington's highest priorities was to come up with a Native American policy. 
He used both diplomacy and aggression, depending on the situation. Upset that so little progress had been made in expanding into the Northwest Territories, he commissioned an army to subdue the native forces. However, in the South, relations with the tribes were more diplomatic. Washington made a treaty in which the native lands would be protected under the condition that they began to move from a hunting culture to a farming one in the hopes of eventually assimilating them into European culture. Initially, Washington and his Secretary of War, Henry Knox, were optimistic, as were many of the natives themselves. However, it wasn't long before swarms of American settlers were pushing into protected tribal territory with no regard for the treaty. Because of the conflicts with the natives in the Northwest, Congress finally recognized the need for a well-trained standing army. Despite their strong reservations and fears of how such an army could be misused, Washington had proposed a standing army all the way back in 1783. As president, he oversaw the creation of the Legion of the United States, the nation's first standing army. Washington also oversaw the birth of the Supreme Court. When he came into office, the Supreme Court was empty. Thus, Washington nominated a justice for every seat. He is the only president with this distinction. Perhaps what Washington's presidency is most commonly known for is setting precedent. Very little of the precedent Washington set was incidental. He was conscious of the fact that everything he did and the way he did it would set the standard for presidents going forward. Everything from the way he regulated state versus federal problems, where he exercised his power versus where he exercised restraint, and simply how he conducted himself around everyone, from formal guests to common people in the streets, was done deliberately. Generally speaking, Washington tried to carry himself in a way that commanded respect and dignity as he believed it was essential that people have a high degree of respect for the office of president. In dealing with Congress, he had to balance not being tyrannical with being firm and making sure Congress had a clear understanding of the power of the presidency. In all of his time in office, he only exercised his veto power twice. In part, he did this to set the precedent that a president wasn't supposed to be constantly butting heads with Congress. However, he also established boundaries. When angry Jeffersonians in the House demanded Washington provide Congress with all papers related to the Jay Treaty, Washington simply refused. He also set a standard for cabinet interactions. It was established in the Constitution that a president would have a cabinet, but the details of how the president would use it weren't specified. Washington let his cabinet speak to him freely, debate with each other, and he accepted their advice. But it was by no means a parliamentary system. Washington ultimately had the final say. In dealing with the Whiskey Rebellion, he established a role for the federal government in employing force to manage conflicts with citizens and states. However, he also demonstrated a balanced approach by suppressing the rebellion without resorting to tyranny. Overall, Washington's actions defined the presidential role as more than just a figurehead, but also not a tyrant. The president was to be a decisive executive who used the Constitution to guide his actions. Though Washington is almost always considered one of the greatest, if not the single greatest president of the United States, his presidency has been criticized. Notably, he's been criticized for his inaction on the slavery issue. Some even criticize him more than other presidents, saying that with his beloved status, he, more than anyone else, could have done something about slavery. And in doing so, he may have even helped the nation avoid the Civil War, which took place 64 years after he left office. Washington had deliberately avoided discussing slavery in public. Privately, he expressed his wish to one day free his slaves and his hope for nationwide gradual emancipation. However, he was also aware of just how bitter the issue was, and considering the fragile condition of the nation, he believed even taking a public stance on slavery might tear the nation apart.
Another criticism was his reliance on Alexander Hamilton, or as some might say, over-reliance. Many claim Washington relied on Hamilton's judgment far too often rather than coming to his own conclusions. Some argue that this reliance on Hamilton was simply representative of Washington's tenure as president, that he was important as a symbolic figure, but that other figures were much more important in the actual mechanics of his presidency. Historian Forrest MacDonald wrote in his biography of Washington, quote, George Washington was indispensable, but only for what he was, not for what he did. He was the symbol of the presidency, the epitome of propriety in government, the means by which Americans accommodated the change from monarchy to republicanism. However, he stated that Washington, quote, had done little in his own right, and had in fact often, quote, opposed the best measures of his subordinates. By contrast, professor of history and author Stephen Knott said that Washington, quote, almost single-handedly created a new government, shaping its institutions, offices, and political practices. Washington's profound achievements built the foundations of a powerful national government that has survived for more than two centuries. Writer and biographer Ron Chernow describes the same sentiment in more detail. Quote, he had restored American credit and assumed state debt, created a bank, a mint, a coast guard, a customs service, and a diplomatic corps, introduced the first accounting, tax, and budgetary procedures, maintained peace at home and abroad, inaugurated a navy, bolstered the army, and shored up coastal defenses and infrastructure, proved that the country could regulate commerce and negotiate binding treaties, protected frontier settlers, subdued Indian uprisings, and established law and order amid rebellion, scrupulously adhering all the while to the letter of the Constitution. Most of all, he had shown a disbelieving world that Republican government could prosper without being spineless or disorderly, or reverting to authoritarian rule. For more videos like this, consider subscribing to the channel. To show your support and have your name featured in the credits, consider making a donation on Patreon of either two, five, or fifteen dollars a month. Patreon link in the description below.